going to pass it over to Arene Zara, assistant curator at the museum and one of our curators for the Paper Routes Women to Watch 2020 exhibition. Hi, Arene. Hi, Carolyn. Um, and thank you. Um, Hi everyone, uh, just to reintroduce myself, my name is Arine Zahra, I'm the Assistant Curator of the National Museum of Women in the Arts. Um, as Carolyn said, one of the two curators for Paper Roots Women to Watch 2020, along with uh, my co-curator and associate curator, Ginny Trainer. Uh, it's wonderful to start out our September tours with Natalia Revilla, our Paper Roots artist representing Peru. Uh, this is the second time Peru is participating in our Women to Watch program, uh, the last time being in the exhibition Heavy Metal in uh, 2018. Um, the Women to Watch program has steadily grown since its inaugural exhibition in 2008. And it's really been due to this collaboration that we have with our outreach committees um, in the United States and internationally, like with our committee uh, in uh, committees in South America. This uh, Paper Roots is our largest women to watch yet. Uh, we have 22 artists uh, representing 22 committees. So that's 12 national committees and 10 international regions uh, represented. So we're really proud of this um, uh, initiative growing and becoming more ambitious with, with um, every installment that we have. Um, so I would just like to thank our Peru committee, as well as our consulting curator, Florencia Portocarrero, for their excellent, amazing in, uh, nominations of Peruvian artists working in paper. Um, if you've been with us, with me and Carolyn and, and Ginny, on our summer journey through these studio tours of our Paper Roots artists, you'll have seen just the range of possibilities that paper offers as a um, as a creative medium, as a primary medium. And it's just been such a treat for us um, to see these artists from different parts of the world being in conversation with one another via this language of paper art. Um, so like I said, today we are joined by Natalia Revia. Um, just give you a little background. Natalia creates these incredible pencil drawings, uh, sometimes with burnt out elements to depict past violence and repression in Peru. She works from photographs. Um, just losing my notes here, Carolyn. Just a sec. Okay. She works from photographs and images in the uh, in the press of political violence to examine the collective memory of history. Um, in Paper Roots, we are presenting a number of her burned drawings that she will talk about, as well as two of her embossed works from her series, 20 Words. Uh, Natalia received her uh, bachelor's in fine arts uh, with a specialty in painting from the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú. She has participated in a variety of exhibitions in her home country um, and abroad, as well as in international contemporary art fairs in Madrid, uh, London, Barcelona, Miami, Bogota, Buenos Aires, and others. She um, is the co-founder of Contexto Ediciones, a publisher, a publishing company that specializes in artist books. Um, and Natalia lives and works in Lima. So welcome, Natalia, and I will hand it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Ori, and thank you, Caroline. I also want to thank you, Jeannie, and the entire team of the museum for all the work and support received, especially in these difficult times. And I want also to thank to the Peruvian Committee, to uh, Consuelo Salinas, Florencia Portocarrero, the curator here, and all the people involved that made this exhibition possible. Thank you for the invitation. So, maybe now I'm going to show you a little presentation. Okay. And Natalia, if you could just speak a little bit louder. Okay. Now, yes. 
So I want to start with this series of drawings in ink and burn paper, which is one of the pieces that will be in the exhibition. So over the years, my work has explored the different forms of representation of violence and its impact in both the collective and private spheres. For example, for this project, I work from two sources of images, first from public material like testimonies, photographs, and newspapers archives that narrates events of political tension in Peru, and second from photographs from family albums. Uh, the right drawing is based on a car bond. Um, the left drawing is a picture of my mother. So my objective was to address the role of representation in the process of reconstruction of memory, and through this, to link personal stories with the collective memory. I am interested in what is chosen to be represented, but above all, what is absent in these discourses. My work has focused precisely on looking at the void, which is one of the axes of my body of work. This drawing is based on a detention. Um, this is about a young man being searched by a policeman. This drawing is about an elderly person carrying a protest sign. Uh, at the same time, the balance of the images is transferred onto the paper through burn holes. As an additional comment on and from the material itself, these burns reinforce the allegory around the voids in a sense of street destruction and mourning. So in that period, there were quite a few walls with graffiti of terrorism, terrorism slogan. And this drawing is based on that. So usually when I start a project, I experiment with different techniques to choose which will work with the support and the idea. I mean, it's important for me to find the best path to convert the idea into something physical. And in this case, burning is hurting also metaphorically. Um, this is the unfinished structures that now is part of the electric metro train system, a project started by the Peruvian government in 1986, but remained unfinished for over almost 20 years due to misappropriation of funds. So well, growing up, I saw these structures close to my house all the time. And for me, they stood as a symbol of corruption. Also, the exploration of the material in the work process led me to understand paper as something very receptive with which one has a dialect since it can be flexible, yet at the same time also very fragile. Um, for this reason, I think that the paper is a material with which there is a plenty of room for experimentation. So this kind of absence has been a constant in my work. These are drawing in paper cut in multiple layers and ink. For example, here, the cutting of the paper has served as a tool of representation. I mean, I use and understand drawing as a record of an action. Instead of ink or any pigment, the idea for me was to draw with the voids. Uh, one of the most, most powerful aspects of emptiness is that there is nothing it is a field full of possibilities for interpretation. This is another drawing in paper cut in multiple layers and in ink. It has, I think, 30 sheets, more or less. 
And this piece is called The Other Side. It could work on painting in black. It's based on the reflection as seen from the lagoon. When a lagoon water is dark, it acts like a mirror and doubles the reflection in the horizon. So with this work, I start a series of pieces arising from the connection of images related to socio-environmental conflicts that I extract from press archives and a selection of personal photographs belonging to my family. Both records were taken in the same towns and cities in the north of the country, in the Amazon province, where I live in my childhood. Uh, like many of us who live in Lima, descended of migrant parents from the provinces, I have grown up marked by different landscapes and costumes. My father is from Amazonas province in the north of the country. Uh, my mother is from Arequipa province in the south. So they meet us in the center of the country in the capital. This piece is from the series of drawings from for here, right here, a nice paper cut. So these drawings, these works investigate the violent transformation of place and landscapes due to human intervention and the effect of natural phenomena, which were the backdrops of my childhood. This is another drawing from the same series. This is a uh, detail. It measures 80 by 60 centimeters, approximately, yes. So the destruction of these spaces through deforestation, the contamination of rivers and illegal mining activities constitute a crisis, not only on a collective scale, but also with regard to the identity of each individual because it shatters our sense of belonging and it is also a silent form of violence on a deep and intimate personal level. This is a drawing in multiple layers too. And this is the last drawing of that series. So here, the cutting of the paper can be interpreted as an attempt to intervene in memory, pointing out the difficulty with which these stories can be narrated. I was interested in working through collective nostalgia and narratives in which fact, fiction, and historical trauma intersect, since the places where we have lived are carried inside of us, and in this sense, constitute us. And this piece is Black River. It's a piece of wood cut by hand and laser, um, painting in black. It's suspended from the ceiling with nylon threads at a height of 40, 45 centimeters above the ground. So this allowed the piece to sway slightly as it floated. This is a photo of the mountain where you can see how the threads were placed. So the idea of installing the place like this was because I want the public to be able to approach the piece from another point of view. Like when you approach the bank of a river and when people get closer to the piece, it generates a smooth movement. Uh, it measures 30.50 meters approximately. And as you can see, it's multiple layers of shallows on the ground convey different levels of depth. This is another view of the installation. So also the dark color of the river and its environments evokes the devastating effects of pollution of the country in recent years. And this piece is called What Was Left. And it's based on a photograph 
taken after the incident's nose as the Bawasu, an act of repression carried out by the government on June 5, 2009, against Native Amazonian people who had blocked a road in an attempt to stop privatization of their land. This is a view of the, of the installation. It's measured 130 by 320 centimeters. And this is a detail. Uh, you can see a flag, a Peruvian flag, placed on the remains of goods and other elements in the middle of the road. So this feeling of ruin and these reminds of a tragedy allowed to a broken national project. And to close this project, I want to show you this series of charcoal drawings on canvas. This series of charcoal drawings is based on photographs circulating in the media. This is about a river contaminated water or is painting in negative. This is a truck carrying illegal luggage wood. A crack caused by an earthquake. And the gap that dynamite produced in the mountains during road constructions. This is an image that I have engraved in my memory of the trips that I used to make on the road with my family as a child. And I chose it because all these drawings represent dysfunctional landscapes. And I want to point how the, the, the images of individual memory can also become in collective adversities. There are also a scenarios that between documentary and fiction communicate possible futures of a tragedy that seems irreversible. And I want to finish with this series of drawings on embossed paper called 20 Words, which is going to be also in the exhibition. These works were inspired by my casual encounter with Machigenga a Spanish dictionary. The Machigenga are indigenous people living in the Peruvian Amazon who speak the Machigenga language, one of the 48 native languages of Peru. So every drawing represents a word in Machigenga which has no direct translation into Spanish because my recent work has aimed and investigated ambiguities, uncertainties, and voids of communication. This was my starting point for this project. I want to open a space that requires imagining what is unsaid and to reveal the constant search for understanding that which is impossible to translate. So this war is Porokatagansi, which means breaking or pumping something brittle. This word is katsatagansi, holding hands. This word is seratagansi, a tremendous chasm. And this is Shingetearinsi, this is when you see the eyes of a person and the pupil reflects the brightness, light, or images. I think this is one of my favorite words. <laughs> this is Tamuato Katagansi, when search for something by dipping your hand or hands into a liquid. And this Tia Boseta Kotagansi being covered by a lot of something, for example, weeds. The right one is Pacoria Tagansi to open your hand, and the left is Apipacotene, the other hand. Each language is a reflection of a particular form of living in the world. 
and evidence of a spirit of community. And for this reason, in all cultural exchanges, especially with encounters among these languages, translation has a foundational importance. In the other hand, it's in this space that one speaks as much of the necessity as of the impossibility of a dialect that isn't understood solely for its linguist function, but rather as a cultural or political instrument, an act of communication in the frame of a given cultural context, and therefore of a particular understanding what the other is. This is shadow of a person, Vamparo Kinsi. And this is Iraganza no en Katagansi, half a note on the throat out of sadness. This is another of my favorites too. And this is Satsagagansi, touch with your fingertips. So nearly the entire body of my work is developed on paper. Also in this series, the most papers show us the capacity of transformation of this material. I decide also to work in this technique because through concave and convex figures, we see how images provide different points of departure and interpretation as a metaphor of the translation itself. I find the contradiction involved in working with paper interesting, which I mentioned before that is in the one hand, it appears to be very accessible and receptive. However, in counterpoint, in addition to being resistant, it's also very fragile. So the change for me here was to find the balance and the correspondence between my own strength and that of the paper when I made this embossed by hands. And now I want to show you some of the works that we have talking about. This is from the Burn series. Um, I made first the drawing in ink in the paper and then I proceed to burn it with a candle, with a little candle and a lot of patience. Um, this is how it looks from behind. So this, is, this work is about a friend who loves a, a relative because when I grew up, I grew up in internal armed conflict that took place between 19th to 2000. And I was born in 1981, so during my childhood, I experienced the events like a fog because I did not understand the full magnitude of things, but the bias, the fears, and the doubts surrounding the conflict filled me with uncertainty. So these words are concerning that time. This project can also be read as the record of our memories and of the violence that marked my generation. This is, for example, another work, and this, uh, this is a self-portrait. This is how it looks from behind. I like also how they look behind. This is another work. And this is all. Um, you can see too. Yes. And these drawings are from the 20 World Series. And as I mentioned, you can see these drawings from the concave or convex part. So these words are Tishita Paponsi, the back of the hand, and Sara Paponsi, the palm of the hand. This is another. And this is Vitan Kovatokansi, holding someone's hand. This is the back.
This is Pakuriatagansi to open your head. And this is Viva Kotagansi. Hold a hand with the other hand. Um, now I want to show you other work the, of the same series. So I'm going to put over here and you can see this. Uh, this is Shitikansi, which means being connected, a plant, for example, roots with a tree. And as you can see, I work this in multiple layers and different kind of papers. So first I made the wash on Chinese ink and then I proceed, proceed to coat put with, with my knife. And then I finally I color with pencil, with black pencils to generate contrast between the layers. Uh, accentuate some dark areas. So also the way to put the, the, this work like this because I want the people can approach from different parts of, of, of you. So I don't know if you have some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. That was wonderful. And um, <laughs> Actually, we have another Women to Watch artist uh, watching, and she just said really powerful work. And, and I agree, this is really, um, you've touched on so many facets of society. And someone else had mentioned as you were talking that uh, a lot of these issues can also be reflected in American society. Um, you know, sort of violence or social, social violence or destruction. Uh, socio-environmental issues. A lot of these same conversations, I think, are happening in countries around the world. So I want to start off by asking, and you're welcome to sit <laughs> if you want to, we're, we're having a conversation, um, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, I want to ask you if art for you then, is it a form of social commentary? Is it something more individual and personal for you, like a personal catharsis for you to be going, you know, going through your family photographs? Is it more to reflect, you know, society and, and, and country? Um, what, what is the purpose of, this is a very general broad question, so take it in however, whatever direction you want to go in. What does art sort of represent for you? Yes, I think that, I think that art can be, the way that you can see a problem in another way. I, I think that art can approach a new point of view. Um, that is the, the powerful thing though, of art. So not necessarily necessary is going to change things. The most of the time doesn't happen that, but I think that, uh, yes, Yes, it's a different approach and in that way it can be used to to tell things about the society and to uh, propose changes. Yeah, I agree. I mean, so it, it's not necessarily offering a solution of some sort, but in a, in a time when we so desperately need to see each other's perspectives and yes. viewpoints on, on issues, um, I think art can do that for you. In a way, and yours certainly does, and presents such a unique point of view. And I see a lot of synergy between form and content in your work. So what I mean by that is that you are discussing, you know, these violent transformations that happen in society, and you show that by actually going through violent transformations through the paper, right? Like you're burning through the paper. How how did you come to that idea? Uh, where did you get the idea that, you know, you want to actually set your, <laughs> your medium on fire? Where did you come up with that? Yes, uh, yes, I, when I start a project, I cannot do a sketch and a sketch and a sketch. It's like I have to 
really have the idea and when I finally got it, I start to do it. It's not like I am, I'm trying and trying. So the burn idea comes because I saw, I read a notice about an art archive that was burned. And I thought about the fragility of the paper that is one of the materials that much artists use all the time. All the people use paper all the time. And I think that uh, what dangers can be the fire on paper, but I, I start to prove the, the drawings, but at the same time, I see how the paper can also be very strong because it's not that fragile that we can think that paper is. And I find that contradiction perfect for the work. So also I, in that time I was living in Argentina and was the first time that I live for a long period out of my country. So I feel kind of insecure, I'm not so well. And all they all come back together to, because the fire was something very, it's something very dangerous, but at the same time it's not that dangerous at all. And the paper, you can see very fragile, but it's not really fragile. So I think that was perfect about that, for that work because you can see the the major the images are very violent but at the same time they are like a searching for something they are not violent itself it's a searching so i think because of that the fire works very well in that conceptually in that in that works yeah this is a theme that i think i've seen with multiple artists in in our exhibition is that this medium almost stands for um, for people because you, you talk about the, that it's both fragile and it's and it's not fragile and I've heard other artists talk about comparing this property of paper to the kind of vulnerability and resilience that people have in society, which I, I think it's like it's such a nice connection between us and the and, and this medium that you're working with. Um, I'm getting questions about your the practice of burning burning the paper. Um, is there room for error? Have you had to ever restart? <laughs> like if have you burned through an image, you decided you didn't like the way it looked and then had to restart it? Well, I, when I start each drawing, I have a thought idea before I do it. I have like a preliminary idea of what I want. But as I burn it, that not happen all the time because I can expose the paper more or less time to the candle to the fire. But finally, the fire decides where it goes. But I think that is kind of interesting not have all the total control of my work. Um, when something happened that I was not thought before, I let it be. So I think that, uh, I think that is that interesting too, because I usually do not read of my work. I, it's like this. It's... So, so then do you make the drawing first? You decide where you're going to have this void space. Yes. Um, and then you take a candle and very slowly kind of burn out those the edges, the outline of that, that part that you're going to have to make void. Is that how you kind of go about it? Yes. For example, for, for, this, uh, for this work, I have to thought that here's where we're going to be the burn part. And I can feel that the image that I have, but for example, there are details like these or these that I wasn't thinking about. Um, yes, that is basically, it's like a, so I'm very, yes. <laughs> and, and, and what kind of paper do you use that looks like a thicker, thicker paper? Yes, I use, uh, almost in all my work, I use watercolor paper, uh, really thick because it's hard to be thick because there is a lot of manipulation of the material. So it's watercolor, acid-free, yes, that kind of color. Yeah. 
Carolyn, you and I just spoke to Lucha Rodriguez, who's our Georgia artist, who also uses watercolor paper. And she, she makes very shallow cuts through the, the paper for the same, same kind of thing that you're saying that she you know, also manipulates the surface of the paper and that that particular paper provides this perfect medium for her. So that's kind of interesting to see two artists manipulating the, the surface of the paper in completely different ways, right? Like exploring the properties of that same exact paper in, um, in very different ways. Um, I'm getting questions, I'm getting a lot of questions. People are, are so in, intrigued by, by your art. Um, let's see, try to combine a few of these. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the sizes of the, of the, the sizes of your burnt works are relatively small. I mean, they're the size of, a, of an eight and a half by 11 sheet on average. Um, do you keep them a, a little bit on the smaller side to, um, to be able to control, control the, the burning a little bit better? Or do you just like working on a smaller size? Do you envision working really, really big burnt pieces ever? Uh, I start, the burning seriously I start with a uh, lot of sizes of works, yes, for controlling the core, but when I make it, make it, and make it, I get some abilities. Um, for example, I'm going to show you. I have one here that is bigger. You can see? Mm, yeah. It's beautiful. That measures, I think, that 70 by 70. No. So yes, centimeters, almost a meter. Yeah, so that's a little bit bigger. I'm just looking at our, the works that are going to be in the show and ours is, uh, we have a few of them that's a bit smaller than the one that you just showed. Yeah. Bigger. Um, I, I like to work in different sizes of, of papers really, because for example, the burning series are smaller but for example, I have cut paper that measures like three meters or more. Um, this cut paper that I showed you before meters like almost two meters. Yes, I like to work in different size. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit, getting questions about this idea of presence and absence. And it's, I think a really um, powerful and haunting way to show, um, you know, loved ones being taken away from you or some something that's close to you being destroyed. Um, and, and somehow through that void or absence of something, you make their presence felt. So can you talk a little bit more about this idea of revealing, revealing the absentee? Yes, I think that, I think that, uh, in every almost in every subject is is more powerful the things that you not say that you that the, the, the things that you say um, I think that is uh, one of my principal axes of work I always look at the voice because I think that they are so powerful for example in the burning series or in the cut papers, I think that you can see uh, the different points of, uh, of a subject, but cutting the principal subject. Uh, the, see the negative part of that. I think that that's more powerful because everybody can see a different uh, thing in that world. Um, I think that that is the, the thing that, that kept my attention in all these, in all my works, really, yes. Uh, we have a co comment um, from Jack and Judith who said uh, that they were noticing that when you burn the paper, you create beautiful closed shapes. Um, and it's interesting to, to them that the shapes generally seem to be closed bounded um, and is there a reason that they're sort of these sort of enclosed within themselves rather than sort of unopen or unfinished or open or unfinished shapes is there kind of a, a purpose behind having them kind of enclosed among within themselves it depends on the 
extent because in one works I have the idea, I don't have the clear idea of what I want, but in another, for example, I want to be more mysterious about what is not saying and maybe in, a, in some drawings I don't have the, the, the specific idea of what I want not going to, to, to show. So I think this half and a half is not all the time so clear for me. And I think that is kind of interesting to me. So how is the difference, uh, um, the experience different between burning through the paper and embossing? Can you talk a little bit about your process of embossing the paper? Yes. It's a different, it's a different transformation of the medium. Transformation, yes. I love being embosses because I have many papers were torn in the process, like many, really many. I tried with different kind of papers. But I really love that part of the work process, the experimentation with the paper. I have wet the paper. I have uh, used a machine to engrave the paper. But I think that when you finally get how do you want to look at it, it's so pleasure. So yes, it's, it's very exciting that. And I think that with them both, I push the paper so until I want to have what I want. So what's a kind of, of game between the support and me? And I, I love the process of the, of the most paper. I love the process, yes. Can, can we talk a little bit more about your 20 words series? So you're, you're presenting words that's spoken by, and just correct me if I'm wrong, by the, by the Machiganga indigenous community that is in the Amazon basin in southeastern Peru, right? And these words don't have an exact uh, equivalent translation in the, the Castellano uh, Spanish that's spoken by the government, which presents a sort of innate problem, right? If the administration cannot communicate with their people, that it presents this, this problem of language. Can you, um, so I just wanted to give people context as you were talking about and presenting these really beautiful works. Um, so can you elaborate on that a little bit? Has this idea of language been something that you've thought about for a while throughout your works? Yes. So I encountered this dictionary by, by casually in internet, and I start to look at, um, there, there is no much words, but there is a little word that I do not understand totally. I have no direct translation, and that was a uh, come from my attention. And well, my father is from the Amazonas province, so he's kind of, I feel kind of, kind of near, uh, I start to investigate, I made uh, interview with linguistic people, also with people that spoke, uh, that speak Machiganga and Spanish. And the last year, because my sister works there, my sister and my brother-in-law works, works there, I can travel to one community, Machiganga, in the Amazon, the Peruvian Amazon, and yes, I think that is a, I think that is a beautiful language. I think that reveals things that amazing is 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 very interesting. But I think that every language has terms that cannot uh, be translated. Not only the Machiganga, many of the language has that. And I think that just this is what is spoke about identity. And here in Peru, we have so many uh, different language that spoke about so many different identities. And there are no connection between us. So I find that to talk interesting because there is a lot of a lot of language that you don't know. So yes. I like to talk about that. Yeah, as I think anyone who's who's learned different languages, a bilingual person, you know that it's so uh 
difficult to find a kind of lingua franca, right? That everybody can have a kind of um, a way to communicate with one another. And sometimes it feels strange to have the spoken word like English or, or Spanish or something be the, the thing that everybody is expected to speak. You might have complete, when you might be coming from completely different traditions. Um, and I think this, this problem that you bring up goes back through history, right? So you've talked about your various explorations, experimentations, you've cut paper, you said you've wet paper, you've burned paper, you've embossed paper. Um, is there anything left for you to explore? Is there anything that you really want to experiment with that you haven't quite done yet? Well, I don't know. I recently, because of the pandemic, I couldn't came here to my studio and I was too much time in my house. So I start to do my own paper. <laughs> so I'm going to see where that leads me. Now, I don't know. That, that's so interesting. You're making, like you're taking pulp and you're, actually, you're going to be making your own paper. And is it going to be similar to this watercolor paper? Uh, is it going to be a different kind of texture, different thickness? I, I don't know. There are very thickness. I have made it with uh, bacteria. So I'm, I'm just uh, doing the, the proofs right now, but I don't know. It, it's interesting. <laughs> it's another it, approach. No, it definitely is interesting. And one of the questions we've been asking um, our artists is how has the pandemic um, affected your your process your practice um and so i guess this is this is one of your your you're kind of rethinking your medium altogether by making it yourself yes yeah yes. and you know I, I think that's a wonderful place to uh close it um thank you so much natalia that was uh so wonderful. I mean, obviously, I knew your work was <laughs> wonderful uh, to begin with, but it was so wonderful to hear you speak about your work and show us images. Um, and just to kind of see you hold them gives us a really good idea of scale um, and the texture of the paper. Just that like your work is one just one of those things that you have, like you just have to see in person, which I know is, is difficult in in 2020 when we can't all be together and seeing things in, in person. 